Today is May the 20th. It's an interview with Mr. Gordon Gecki, born 10-15-1922. Interviewer is Robert Gardner. Interviewer is being conducted at the Atlanta History Museum. Mr. Gecki, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Later? Where were you living at the time? In Watertown, Wisconsin. Why did you join? I registered for the draft and I found at that time it was time to make a decision. Did I want to be an infantryman or did I want to be something else? I decided I would like to be a pilot in the Army Air Corps. Do you recall your first day in service? Yes. What was it like? It was on a train trip, a troop train, going from Milwaukee, Wisconsin to Miami Beach, Florida and it was not an air-conditioned train and we stayed on it the entire trip which lasted about 50 some hours. Can you tell me about your boot camp or training experience? Uh, my training experience was in Miami Beach. We lived in a hotel. Sounds quite luxurious but remember the army will strip them down and you have nothing but bunk beds and none of the entities of a hotel room we did a lot of practice marching and on the sands or the coral of Miami Beach it's quite white, quite dazzling in the sun also. In those days sunglasses were no way could you wear them. So by the time the day was up, after eight hours of up and down on the coral, you were not only tired but your eyes were glazed. Do you remember any of your instructors? Yes. Uh, I went into flight training and I have a log book with all of my instructors. My first instructor was a man by the name of Mundy. He was a civilian instead of an Air Force officer and he contracted to teach Air, Army Air Corps students. How did you get through it? With a lot of sweat. <laughs> and I say that because I am not a natural born pilot. I managed to make sloppy turns according to the instructors. I managed to not hold altitude as correctly as he would have liked. Uh, I got through it though simply because I knew what I wanted and I wanted to be a pilot and that was it. No matter what it took, I was going to be a pilot. Which war or wars did you serve in? WW2. Where exactly did you go? I started out in the continental United States after my graduation as a second lieutenant from George Field, Illinois. We went to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska to form B-24 crews. A B-24 consisted of 10 people. We formed into a crew at Lincoln, Nebraska, then went on to Davis, Monthan Field in Tucson, Arizona for transition training prior to going overseas. And I left for overseas from Sacramento, California. Do you remember arriving overseas and what it was like? Yes, I very much. We went overseas in a C-54, which was a transport plane, and it was uh, operated by the Air Transport Command. We went from San Francisco to Hawaii, to Johnson Island, to Kwajalein, to Tarawa, and then to Nedzep, New Guinea. What exactly was your job or assignment on the aircraft? I was a B-24 pilot and a four-engine pilot had an MOS of 1092. Did you see combat? Yes. In the South Pacific, uh, we flew combat strikes from Nadzap and Leyi, New Guinea into Finchhaven and so, and then we also did a lot of bombing of the oil fields in Balakapapan. And Many of our flights were 12 to 14 hours. I also was in Mindoro Island in the Philippines where we flew against the Japanese as they were bringing planes back into China and Okinawa with the then French Indochina. Were there many casualties in your unit? From actual combat, not so many. Most of our uh, act, killed in action or killed were related to uh, mis 
functional air aircraft and or perhaps weather. Could you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences? Yes, one of the most memorable. We were to do some railroad yard bombing in Fan Rang, China. No, Fan in uh, White Cloud Airdrome, I'm sorry, in uh, China. And when we went over the rail yards, we went in at about a thousand feet, and one of our other assignments was to take out a bridge. Well, to take out a bridge with a 500 pound bomb from a B-24 is almost impossible. The phase of it that I do remember quite well, there were a group of people on one of the shores. One of them had a bicycle, and he started riding across the bridge as we were making our bombing pass. Wouldn't you know, the one bomb and a thousand that hit, hit that bridge, and he and the bicycle, I'm sure, were oblivion. But I had, it was so unusual to see somebody coming for what was an intended target, riding a bicycle, and he certainly went up in glory. Do you have any other experiences you'd like to relate? Yes. Uh, the Japanese, at the time they were under siege in uh, the Philippines, had Fort Drum located in the harbor of Manila. One of our assignments was to try to bomb them out of that Fort Drum, and that is exactly what it was. It was a drum deep down into the water and where they'd go under. Our bombs would just basically hit and bounce off. We never did bomb it into submission. It was later taken over by the Marines who made of an amphibious assault against it. But it was a memorable experience to see the city of Manila laying before you and circling the harbor, and we did a lot of circling. The most, I'm going to relate one more experience, and I think this was the most thrilling that I've ever seen. When the Japanese surrendered, the battleship Missouri, as all of you know, was in the harbor, and we had the assignment of circling the harbor on armed patrol, fully loaded with bombs and ammunition, and were told to drop if we were fired at at any time. We, of course, could not go over Tokyo Bay itself. The Amara was under us, but we certainly had a wonderful view of all of the surrender ceremonies. And it is only in recent years I had a, another thrill, and that was on a trip to China, passing over Tokyo Bay in its peacetime status. What type of things did you notice that were different other than that you didn't, didn't have a, a large armada of military ships out there over Tokyo Bay when you went over? Well, there, uh, there was a lot of air cover, of course. Not only were the bom heavy bombers in the parade, but there were quite a few fighter aircraft. And the harbor, of course, was a busy activity of the signing. Everything else was barred. There was no water activity whatsoever during the, sur the surrender ceremonies. It, it, if you ever saw a lot of ships, battleships and other, that was it. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes. I was awarded the Air Medal with one oak leaf cluster. I was awarded the, uh, uh, you know, just a minute here. I should know, really, basically, I do. That's okay. <laughs> I was ordered the Asiatic Pacific Theater Ribbon with eight battle stars. I had the uh, World War II Victory Ribbon, the Philippine Liberation Ribbon, and I've also received the Army Commendation Medal. Were these for any particular events that happened, or these were just... They general? basically were awards. You received the Air Medal after so many hours of combat, and after that then you received an oak leaf cluster for the additional hours accumulated. The uh, Asiatic Pacific Ridge was basically because you were in the theater of operations and flying uh, combat patrols during that time. You mentioned the combat and the, the, the bombing runs and things. What was that like? A bombing run basically is very boring until you get to the target. As I said, we had a lot of runs that were 10, 12, 13 hours. Uh, can I just pour a little side light and say that in the course of these bombing raids, we had no sanitary facilities on those bombers. 
we did have K-ration boxes. So those people who felt an urge would do it into the K-ration box. We had great joy in tossing those out with the moms. And we always wondered what Tojo said when they hit. The uh, other area that is particularly, during the time that you're over target, there is a certain amount of anti-aircraft fire. The Japanese did not have the anti-aircraft fire that the people of Europe found. We did, on a bombing run over a career run Formosa at a copper factory, get hit. And we got pretty well winged in the area of the wings where you could just see the gas flowing out. Fortunately, our self-sealing tanks did take over and uh, we got away from the target area. We then had the long run back of about nine, six hours, and we had available, we did lose one engine, we lost number three engine, which was shot out, so we were flying on three engines. We also had the opportunity at the bottom of Formosa to rendezvous with a submarine and ditch the airplane, and or try to make it back to Clark Field. To ditch an airplane just is not always very successful for all 10 people. So we opted to go to Clark Field. We threw 50 caliber machine guns out. We threw everything we could get our hands out to uh, get back. We did make it back to Clark Field. We landed and uh, they looked over the airplane and declared it junk. So they saved the engines and jumped the rest of the fuselage. At that time, we were on Mindoro Island in the Philippines, which is approximately another eight to nine hundred miles away. So we finally got in touch with our bomb group who sent an aircraft up to come and get us. And that was one of my most thrilling adventures during the time we were bombing. Were you in command of the aircraft at the time? I was the pilot, yes. So you, you had to make the ultimate decision whether to ditch or to keep, keep, on, yes. keep on trying. Yes. We uh, certainly had a quick conference with all members of the crew and almost Every one of us said, let's try it. Ditching to a submarine uh, on patrol, not only is it very hazardous to ditch, but you also have the uh, contemplated of staying in that submarine uh, sardine can type thing until you're, they reach shore somewhere. It was not a desirable type of situation. <laughs> I can understand that completely. <laughs> that, that sounds like a, uh, uh, a very harrowing experience for a young man to to uh, have to go through. It's a harrowing experience now. In those days it wasn't. It was just an adventure. When you look back on it from this standpoint, yes. Then we didn't think all that much of it. We're just glad to get back to Clark Field. How did you stay in touch with your family? By mail. They had V-mail. I don't know many people these days know what an V-mail is. They know email, of course. V-mail was a little letter photograph that was sent on to you. Did you get many care packages from your family? or? No, not because they didn't want to send them, but simply because of the distance involved and the supply factor. Uh, for people who were in Europe, bear in mind that we in the Pacific were supposedly in a holy war. We did not have the equipment that was to come to us after the defeat of Germany. So consequently, many of our supplies were very limited. Our uh, airmail services and uh, mail services were also somewhat limited. What was the food like? It uh, was powdered eggs. It was bacon in cans and uh, very salty. The uh, average mess was powdered stuff, powdered and uh, fresh vegetables. The juices were not very frequent. Uh, we did get a beer ration once a week of two cans of beer. It was flown in from Australia. And the beer, the only way, we had no refrigeration as such. The only way to get beer cool was to put it in a sock, hang it outside your tent, and drink it first thing in the morning. And it was cool. And of course, two cans, you're not going to get in a lot of trouble. Did you have plenty of supplies? No. As I said earlier, 
most of the things. For example, in Europe, every crew had their own airplane. We did not have enough airplanes so that each individual crew could have an airplane. We rotated airplanes. One crew would fly it one day, one crew the next day, and so on. Did this cause any uh, unusual problems or, or stress or anything because you weren't able to be familiar with the craft? Uh, no, a B-24 is a B-24, whether you fly a Model M or you fly a Model J or something like that. They're basically all of the same. The only uh, basic things that uh, we didn't, uh, I couldn't call them stress, but they were always on our mind, we really didn't get the amount of flying hours that we wanted to complete our tour to go home. So as a net result in the rotating of crews without sufficient airport, airport you couldn't utilize the full extent of your crews. How many hours did you, would you have had to, to fly to be able to leave the theater of operations at the end of your, your, your planned duty cycle? Well, we didn't have a set amount of hours as they did, or missions as they did in Europe. We went on hours. I had 256 combat hours in, and I was not ready to come home except for the fact that the war ended. I probably would have had to stay for another 100 hours 350, 300 to 350 was normal for rotation of crews. Was there something special you did for good luck? <laughs> no, 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 I never had any uh, particular qualms or worries about having some token or something as a uh, uh, good, keep me a safe. How did people entertain themselves? We did not have much entertainment. Uh, Entertain yourself basically would be to see if you couldn't uh, find an army bakery somewhere and con them out of a loaf of bread. See if you couldn't somewhere on the island find a cantaloupe or a melon or something. Uh, we did not have any organized activities as such. We did have evening movies. But other than that, you were pretty much on your own to find yourself something to do. Reading was very popular. Books were very scarce. Did you ever get any professional entertainers to come in? There were some. Uh, I think I remember being in Lay, New Guinea when there was an entertainer there. I unfortunately at this stage don't remember who it was. But as an average, no, we got very few. Did you get any leave while you were over there? No. No. Where did you travel while in the service? Well, I traveled in continental United States from Miami Beach to Bennettsville, South Carolina, from South Carolina to Sumter Field in, or Shaw Field in Sumter, Georgia, South Carolina rather. Then from there on, I went to Miami, or Tampa, Florida to fly gunnery students for a while. From there, went to, uh, as I re earlier read Lincoln, Nebraska, Tucson, Arizona, Sacramento, California, for departure. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Well, the unusual events, I basically spoke to you about the bicycle going over the bridge. Uh, other than that, no, I don't recall all that much. Were there any pranks that you or others would pull on each other? Certainly, there are always some pranks. We couldn't do too much. Uh, one of them was the sudden deflation of an air mattress during the night. We uh, did not have uh, Quonson hot type barracks or anything else. We lived strictly in tents. And earlier you asked about activities. Well, we were always trying to build a wooden floor for our tent. So we'd try to hustle up wooden ammunition boxes and things like that. And our pranks were not all. We did have an unusual incident in the island of Mindoro. We were kind of up on a high hill. And one of the gentlemen, and I remember his name, his name was Lieutenant English, decided we should have some pork chops. Well, pork chops, you know, just don't come through the regular supply route. How did he decide to get the pork chop? He shot a pig in the farmer's field below us. And the farmer was a little irate, came charging up the hill, waving a machete and saying, you killed my pig, you killed my pig. Everybody got into their wallet, picked out a dollar or so, and 
paid the man off and enjoyed our pork chops. Do you have any photographs? Yes, quite a few. Would you like to show them to us? Yes, please? definitely. We're not going to mention this on the film, but Tom. If you'd like, you can show us some of the pictures that you have now. I'd be glad to. Let's start it off by showing a B-24 and its 10-man crew. There were four officers and six enlisted men. The individual, uh, first one is the pilot. At that time, I was a co-pilot, and I am next to the second one. The other one in there is the navigator, whose name was Charlie Hangs, and the bombardier, Milt Nordstrom. It's interesting to know that all of these people are alive with the exception of one individual, and that's John Gall at the bottom part of the picture. And, of course, none of us are spring chickens anymore. The average age of us now, uh, the bombardier was he's perhaps 86 or 87 today. Noel Lutze, the pilot I spoke to, is 85. I'm 81, and the rest of the gentlemen are living in all parts of the United States. We do, I do hear from several of them at Christmas time. We do exchange Christmas cards. Oh, that's wonderful that you're still together after all that's these years, right. all the experiences that you shared together. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. And some other ones? Unlike Europe, as I spoke of, we lived in tents. These are some of the tent areas that we had on Mindoro Island in the Philippines. Notice the washerman in there and our wash machine. It's a big drum with a paddle to stir the clothes and then we agitated so that became our automatic washer then. The island of Mindoro was our home for approximately four months before we moved on to Okinawa. One of the big delights, as you can see, I believe I'm sitting there in a chair. We made that out of ammunition crates also. You were the first original recyclers. <laughs> well, pretty close. Yeah, it's a good thought. I had to give you that much attention to it and so on. <laughs> the uh, pictures that you see here are nose art on airplanes. Almost every B-24 had some type of nose art, as well as other aircraft in the Army Air Corps fleet. And as I mentioned earlier, we were the U.S. Army Air Corps, not the U.S. Army Air Force. We preceded the Air Force, which came into its own in about 1946 or 7. Can you see these? Could you hold those up, please? Yeah. Whoops. Oh. Then we get that, all right? Oh, that's good. Okay. Okay. Each mission that was on a bombing was recorded by placing a bomb, a picture of a bomb beside. As you can see, this aircraft has been on quite a few missions. Oh, yes. Wow. Again, denoting the missions this craft was on. Wow, that's, that's tremendous. And uh, slightly dangerous was always quite a little airplane to fly. One of the pilots over there had a girlfriend and he depicted her on one of the aircraft. He talked the ground crew into painting a little likeness of her on it. Well, now that had to, that had to mean a lot to him and to it her It did, both. it did. Unfortunately, again, as I say, we rotated airplanes, so he didn't fly that all the time. Uh, that's still a, oh, a fantastic memento for him to have. This picture is the sanitary facilities, also known as a latrine. 
in the New Guinea area, it was not uncommon to be comfortably perched on a latrine and have a stroll of natives walking by, the father with a bow and arrow over his back, the wife in tow, and behind that three, four, five, six kids. So it was a scenic area. <laughs> you learned that, that modesty wasn't, wasn't something to be concerned yeah, it's with. It's about right. Uh-huh. This picture is one of a B-24 aircraft. It was taken, again, with a small little baby brownie Kodak, which is nothing like sophistication of today's digital cameras, but it looked the pictures they did. Our living quarters, I'm one of the people photographed on there. Uh, it was a luxury to get enough ammunition boxes together to make a wood floor on there because the minute it rained and it rained a lot in the South Pacific, the tent floor became a sea of mud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm relaxing against the side of a B-24. We normally wore flying suits a one-piece garment and it was rare that we'd be in khakis or anything. And it was a rare day on this one. Of course, I really helped by supporting this airplane. <laughs> uh, can we use this? Sure. Well, I don't look like this now. That's how I did look. When I went through flight school and graduated. You either graduated as a flight officer or as a second lieutenant. I was fortunate to be the second lieutenant. This is our luxury of a shower. It consists of a P-38 belly tank that we scrounged, put and built a tripod to put it up on, and by the time that you left it out in the sun for a while in the Pacific, you had a good hot shower when you were ready. <laughs> the inventiveness of man. All right, on this. Mm -hmm. There was a very popular war correspondent whose name was Ernie Pyle. Some of the older people will recognize that name. I'm sure some of the youngers won't. Ernie, unfortunately, was killed on the island of Aishima, just north of Okinawa. This is his original grave. Ernie's body is now in the punch bowl in Hawaii. Mm, that's fantastic. This is a picture of his, our bombardier in his combat gear. We all wore 45 automatics in a shoulder holster, as he has on there. When we'd go on a mission, we were always given an escape packet. It would have a, flag, a silk map of the areas, it would have some currency, and it would have a little compass in it. It was in a waterproof kit, and you take it out, when you came back, you would always uh, turn it back in. He, uh, luxury was to find someone on the island who grew some type of melon, and we find it a extreme luxury to be able to have one of those. The oh, let's see what we got here. You want to go into the diary? How about the pictures of the? Uh... These pictures depict 
the arrival of the Japanese surrender team. They came in a Betty airplane, which was the nomenclature for the type aircraft they were flying. It was painted white and had a green cross on it. This was on the island of Okinawa, and you can see the United States generals greeting them in one of the pictures. The picture that shows a tall gentleman there is that of General MacArthur. They went into a uh, transport plane and were transported to Manila, where the details of the ceremony were worked out. As you all know, the final ceremony was on the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Those are fantastic pictures. Wonderful. Uh, I am looking for a place someday to, 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 who has a museum to put those on display. Oh, I mean, you might. Uh... These two books. These two books represent an accurate record, a certified record of all my flying hours and where the flights were to and so. So this is when I went to uh, preparatory. This is a Piper Cub flight record where we put in 10 hours. This is the graduation onto the PT-17, the PT-13, the A-10, and then the B-24. That's a, that's a big step. It is, truly <laughs> so. And this is a picture of a B-24 over a target area. The B-24 would carry a variety of bombs depending on its mission. The heaviest bomb it would carry would be a 4,000 pounder. The average type was probably 500 to 2,000 pounds. If you carried 4,000 pounders, you could only carry four of them. You carried 500 pound bombs, you could carry 20 of them. So it varied the capacity on what you were transporting, what type of target you were working. This is the history of the 380th Bomb Group and its five squadrons, the 529th, the 530th, 531st, and the 5th Air Force, which we were a part of at that time. By way of interest, the 5th Air Force has never been stationed within the continental United States. It's always been overseas. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. You might just want to... This is showing some of the area that we were stationed in and or bombed against. There's a lot of open water there. A lot of open water. <laughs> you bet there is. And uh, just off the record speaking, for your edification. Did you happen to keep a personal diary? I did. And this is it right in my hand. I have been at such incidents as bombing runs we went on to, the number of the airplane that we flew in, the number of hours where we went to, and a lot of drivel of leisure time trying to scrounge things. <laughs> What did you think of your fellow officers or soldiers? An individual that you're with every day of the week, 24 hours a day, you have no problems with. We all got along well, we respected each other, and we had fun when we could. The uh, commanding officers of the groups and so forth, they all had one thing in mind, let's do our best to win the war. 
Do you recall the day your service ended? I certainly do. I was discharged at Fort McCoy, with, was Camp McCoy, Wisconsin in those days, and had about a four-hour train ride to meet my wife, who I had not seen for over 11 months, and my mother and family. And funny thing about it, when I arrived, my wife was in the bathtub. So I, you can imagine how hurriedly she got put together. What did you do in the days and weeks afterwards? Tried to, uh, well, first of all, to be honest with you, tried to figure out what to do in the ensuing time. Also, because I lived in a small town, the population which was about 10,000 at the time, uh, I received quite a few offers from clubs and so forth to make speaking appearances, which I did. I was on leave until the end of January, and after that, I immediately started looking for work. I did not feel that schooling was for me at the time, and as a net result, I wound up uh, going to work. Did you eventually go to school under the GI Bill? No, I did not. Well, let me rephrase that. Yes. I took some uh, flying lessons to acquire a commercial flight license, which I did have, and I do have in possession a commercial pilot's license. For a little afterthought, I did think of flying with the airlines. I made applications at United, Northwest, and American. Uh, I found out that the jobs were going to the six, seven thousand, eight hour pilots, and my little 1,500 hours didn't count for much, so it gave that thought of a career up. Did you make any close friendships while in the service? Yes. Uh, some of them I still keep in contact with. There were uh, fellows from other squadrons. I do go to the 380th Bomb Group reunion each year and re-meet some friends that I've known through the years of being in the reunion and Bomb Group Association. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Bob, who I particularly remember and we correspond with to this day. Did you join any other veterans organizations? I belong to the VFW as well as the American Legion. And on non-veteran, I belong to the Silver Wings fraternity, which requires that you have, a, have a soloed an airplane at least 25 years ago. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? I originally went to work for what was then known as Retail Credit Corporation. They're now known as Equifax. I stayed with them for about two years and found that uh, General Motors was hiring. I went to work for General Motors in their insurance division known as Motors Insurance Corporation and I worked out of Milwaukee, Fargo, North Dakota and uh, areas such as that. I was a branch manager when I retired. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Definitely. It convinced me in several things that the discipline that the Army produces is very uh, good in putting a career together. It makes you dedicated to your work, I think. If you belong to a veterans organization, what kind of activities does your post or association have? I do not know. I am very inactive in it. Uh, I'm, frankly, in retirement, I'm busier than I was <laughs> before I retired, I swear. You mentioned that you attend the reunions. Is this basically for the bomber group reunions? Yes. This is a 500, uh, 380th bomb group and its squadrons, and it encompasses anybody who was in it and does not designate just officers or enlisted men or anything like that. It encompasses all. How did your service and experiences affect your life? They, it, it affected me in knowing that I think that there was a purpose in life, in everything that there is a something to accomplish, whether it is getting an increase in wages, whether it is doing your work to the capability that you feel that should be done, and it also, again, going on a repeating basis, it taught me discipline. 
it taught me that uh, when you want to do something, and I think the biggest thing that I got out of it, I really was not a proficient pilot, but I wanted to be one so bad that I overcame any uh, roadblocks in its path simply because I wanted to be one, and it showed me if you're dedicated enough, you can do it. Again, as I said, I was not a natural born pilot. Is there anything you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? No, uh, other than the fact that I gained a lot from my experience. I probably would be not where I was today had I not gone through it. I did believe enough in the Army that I stayed with it. I stayed in reserve. I am retired from the Army, and uh, I retired as a major. Well, I want to thank you very much for doing this interview. It's been my pleasure and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to give us your story. Bob, Thank it was so a much. pleasure to be with you this morning. I appreciate it. My flight. Uh, and we are invited, uh, given the Royal Australian Air Force wings to wear. We were under command of the Royal Australian Air Force in uh, overseas for the first six months till we got it completely organized. Consequently, we've been awarded the RAAF wings, and the RAAF pilots have been awarded the American wings to wear. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a really nice uh, point at the end. Oh, thank you so much You're for welcome. sharing that with us.